G'day and welcome back. Today I've got a Chrysler 11-99. Uh, I'm not sure what year this was made. The exterior stayed uh, consistent, but the interior changed. The design inside changed a bit. But it is a valve radio. It's AM only. Uh, it's got a volume and on-off switch and a tuning dial. That's it. The, the dial doesn't look too bad. It's reasonably clear that the plastic hasn't, you know, discoloured and the dial looks all right, but I can't move it. It's frozen, so I, I don't know if it's the dials back onto the plastic or what, but uh, they won't move. Uh, this whole front panel's painted, this um, colour down here and this one here, so uh, they should clean up okay. They look pretty good. Uh, the rest of the case is quite yellow. It's probably not showing up in the camera. But if I lift this handle up here, you can see that's the original colour. So it's quite yellow very yellow. So I should be able to use the peroxide treatment on this and it might come up nice. I bought this back in uh, 2019. I bought it in Melbourne from a shop, a standard Mornington somewhere. Uh, it was a shed on the side of the road, a dirty shed with a guy in there drinking something or other. I think he was drinking wine. He wanted $60 for it and I offered him 30 and I think we settled on about 40 or something. Now the idea of this size of radio was a, it was a kitchen radio and uh, after breakfast mum would be washing the dishes, she'd have the radio on and then she'd finish washing the dishes up, the kids are at school, dad's gone to work and she could pull the handle out the back here, lift it up and take it out and do the laundry or wander out in the garden. It is powered by main supply, there's no battery in it uh, but she would just have to plug it in somewhere else. Now I'm guessing this is how you pull it apart, That's, this is an earth um, screw as well so I, I've done these radios before, not this model, similar radios and they also had the earth and the antenna screws as part of the um, screws that hold the back on. It's a little bit weird. All right, let's see if this back will come off. All right, here it comes. So the back took a little bit of struggling to get out. But anyway, this is really dirty. So it looks like it's got sawdust on it or something. But it certainly doesn't look like it's been touched since 1970 odd. Now, I notice it's got a rectifier in it. They later went to a silicon diode. So it's a four valve set, which is a bit unusual because they'd moved away from reflex sets. So whatever. Um, but anyway, it, it looks original. It um, should be an easy fix. Actually, looking at that now, hang on. I can see that's a 6GV8. So they're a dual valve. So it's got a pentode and a, a triode built in. So that'll be the preamp and the output valve in one amp. They were pretty popular back at that time. Now that I know it's got the 6V4 rectifier and not the silicon diode in there, I'll go and get the correct uh, schematic for it. I think I'll take it out into the workshop before I take it any further and just blow all this um, rubbish off. And then I'll come back and we'll pull it out of the uh, case here. I took it out of the shed and blew it out. Gee, it come up good. It's clean as a whistle in there. And it appeared to be a sawdust, so maybe this ended up out in somebody's workshop somewhere. I also downloaded the schematic. There's nothing unusual in here. Um, 455 for the frequency of the IF, normal tuning range, alignment conventional, so they don't even tell you. It's just everyone knows. Here's the schematic, and here's that uh, 6GV8, and there's the triode and the pentode, so it's just one valve split. So it's a one, two, three, four, five valve set. Uh, this has got the 6V6 in it. It appears that there's no um, schematic for the diode one anyway. But that's nicely done there. It's got the HT2, HT1, a bias there. Look at that. So nice and easy to read. That's good. I'll take the metal uh, chassis out of the case. There's some screws in there. I think there's five, the little booklet said. All right, the knob should pull off. Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. And this will simply un oh, it's very loose. It'll unscrew. Uh, this little retaining screw is designed to push these little fingers out and jam it in the plastic there. And after about 70 odd years, I'm not sure what's going to want to come off again. They don't seem to be gripping it. I'll, maybe I'll try and turn it might just sort of screw off. There we go. Ooh. All I'll have to do is undo the five screws here and this should pop out. OK. 
go. All right, all the screws are out. Should just pop out. There we go. All right, they came out. Oh, that's look at that. That front panel came off. Oh, terrific. So I can keep that aside, just clean it up a bit, and I'll be done. Yeah, oh, look, the bugs have eaten the speaker again. So this must have been out in a workshop or garage or something somewhere. It's covered in this sawdust, and bugs have eaten it. So it's been outside somewhere. Otherwise, it looks all right. It looks good. And the um, there's the mounting for the capacitor. They're good. The rubber is excellent. It's like a silicony kind of rubber, a plastic rubber or something. I'm not sure what it's called, but um, it's held together well. Let's have a look at the bottom. Well, the bottom is very neat. Um, got some fairly modern looking capacitors in there. They're not very big. Uh, what are they? 40 microfarad. That's not bad, is it? Good size. What's that one? 20 microfarad, 150 volts. Uh, that's 150 volts too. Hmm. Uh, we've got about one, two, what, six capacitors in there to change. I'll change those, of course. That's it. It'll be, this'll work. This'll work for sure. I'll plug it in. We'll see what it does. Okay, I've got an aerial on. I've got it on dim bulb. Uh, 140. I'll turn that down a little. Go to the mid 30 somewhere. There we go. Here we go. Lights are on. Or oh, the light. Here it is. There is a lot of farms here, but we have a lot of people that aren't on farms that are in units and duplexes that come here because they get that opportunity to have their children experience the farm single day. Exactly what I thought. It's going to work perfectly. Shoes on all their clothes. So there's absolutely nothing to do. It's very tight. I could loosen that up. By this stage of development, these radios just work so well and minimum parts, it's, it's pretty good. So it doesn't even sound like it's got any distortion, so uh, yeah, it's looking good. So, oh. Cost you one Newcastle after that. Sounds like the pot's losing contact right at the end there. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's come good anyway. So that fixed itself. All right. I'll just flip it over. I'll do a couple of quick voltage checks just to, for fun. And then I've got to replace the caps and we'll clean up the case. Uh, here's the schematic and the power supply. It's got a primary and just a single um, secondary. There's no center tap. Uh, it's powering both anodes there. So um, it's... Uh, half wave rectification the other end's going to ground through a 120 ohm resistor so that gives you a bias of minus five so for voltages we've got minus five 110 and 80 easy so i've got it powered up it's on full voltage i put it on full voltage it's working all right okay so pin nine is the grid so if i get on there it should be minus five it's minus four so that cap's probably leaking a little bit uh, now the other one was 80 on this small capacitor 78 and the large one here should have been 110 I think 109 there you go this is a 6 GV8 uh, it's got 30 volts on one and 105 on number six so there's one it should be 30 volts 27.8 oh, that'll do uh, what did I say number six there it is it should be 105 101 that'll do here's the IF amp uh, one should be 45 six should be 80 so pin number one should be 45 47 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 should be 80, 77. Here's the uh, 6 and 7, that's the mixer. Pin 1's 45, then we've got 7 and 8 at 80. So that's pin 1, should be 45, 47, and uh, 7 and 8 are these ones. 77, they're supposed to be 80. Okay, good enough. So all these voltages are pretty good, and there's a little bit of hum, so it'll be these two guys here. I'll get rid of those. The coupling cap may be leaking. Um, 120 ohm, there it is there. Hang on, let's have a look at that. 
that's dropping five volts so yeah it might be just leaking a little bit so what i'll do of course is i will change those capacitors uh, they are likely to go short at any time if i just left them there i'll check all the resistors as i go anything over 10 or 20 percent i'll change and the rest of it i'll just uh, do the peroxide treatment to the case i thought i'd start the uh, capacitor replacement by changing these two electrolytics the 20 uf capacitor will replace with a 22 uf at 200 volts and the 40, I'm going to replace with a 47 uh, UF, 200 volts. That's the closest I can get to 40, unless I use a 33. Before I change these two capacitors, I thought I'd have a bit of fun. I've set up a microphone, and I thought I'll record the amount of hum, and then compare it after I've replaced the capacitors. So I've set up a little microphone on a tripod, and I've got it a certain distance from the speaker, which is this plastic spool. And I'll turn the volume to minimum, and it's tuned off station. Now the set's been warming up for about five minutes. Uh, I'll record it now. We'll see what it looks like. Well, that reading's not too bad, is it? So we'll see what difference it makes with the new ones in. I've replaced the two capacitors and they've come out quite neat. They've mounted in very neatly. I have the mic set up again and I measured it with a little plastic spool. It's in exactly the same place. Now just going by the amount of hum, I don't think it's any different. I think those capacitors were perfect. So I'll start the recorder. Here's the volume level with the old capacitors, and here's the new ones. There's not much difference, is there? Why? They're exactly the same. So the old capacitor's probably working all right, but here's the date stamp on them, and it's 3168, so I'm assuming that's week 31 of 68, 1968. Anyway, I was just having a bit of fun, but just shows that Dukon made uh, reasonably good capacitors in 68. I've changed the other caps here. Uh, I checked all the resistors as I went around, and they were all fine. They were all within 10%. So I'm going to leave those in there. There's the casualty list, not much at all on this radio. So I replaced that coupling cap, of course. I want to check the voltage on the grid of the output valve. I'll put it on a dim bulb just to start it up. I assume it's going to work. I didn't do too much work to it. Bulb's not coming on. I'll go to full power. It's been about five minutes. I've put it back to 240 volts there. So I'll measure it here. I think I can measure it there. And you've got 4.9, it's supposed to be 5. So it's come up about uh, 1 volt after changing that coupling capacitor. I guess that's what it was. I didn't change the valve or any of the resistors, so uh, that's the only thing that's changed. All right. I've turned the radio over again, and I'll just make sure it's working. It's all warmed up still. There's a bit of noise, a bit of crackling going on there. There might be some dirt still in that tuning capacitor, so I'll go and blow it out again. Now also, it's really hard to turn, and it's got a, a loose area, so it'll be the bearings as the bearings roll back and forth and hit each other. So you can turn it easy there, and then it gets tight. So it'll be the little ball bearings in the front. I'll clean them and grease them up. And the volume control's tight too, so I'll put a bit of oil down there, and I'll see if I can get some grease into the capacitor there. This is the front of the tuning capacitor looking through the hole in the front panel and there's little ball bearings in there and they're pretty gummed up and black, a bit hard to see there but uh, they're full of dried grease. So I'm going to go outside in the workshop and I'll spray it with some degrees or something to get it out there, clean it up, then I'll put some new grease in there. Uh, for the volume control, just put a bit of oil there and it might get in there. No, it's getting in a little bit. I'll let it sit for a bit, put a bit more oil on it. Let it sit and, uh, whoa, that should, that should work. I took all this out to the shed and cleaned it all up. I used a bit of degreaser on the uh, bearings there and they cleaned up really nice. So I'll give it a go. Yeah, that's good. I've put the power back on. I want to see if that capacitor still crackles. I brushed it out and sprayed it and blew it out some air. From ABC no, Radio fine. All right, no sign of any crackling there. The radio is working fine. I will check the IF frequencies, make sure that's right. Um, I'll do that a bit later. The next thing I want to look at is this speaker and the little holes in it. I have a bit of masking tape here, and I'm going to put it over the hole in the back of the speaker. I'll get this as far down as I can. The idea was that I put the tape on, put some 
uh, rubber cement in there, then remove the tape later. What I'm going to use is liquid electrical tape and it just dries like a piece of rubber. So I should be able to paint it on here. Just like that and it'll form on the back of that masking tape and I should be able to peel the masking tape off later. I did this on the Normande radiogram speakers and uh, that worked really well. I think that'll do, it looks all right. It'll dry a bit flatter than what it is now. I'll leave it for a couple of hours and uh, see how it comes up. I'm out in the workshop. I was just gonna start doing the Retrobrite uh, procedure on this plastic to try and get the yellow out. I've thoroughly washed them and uh, they've come up pretty good. There's some little dots on the top here and I thought they were fly spots, but I don't think they are. I think this has been in a workshop and it's got some welding uh, sparks on there and burnt it slightly. So I'll try and sand them off. So I've got some waterproof paper here. This is 1200 grit in the European standard. Not sure what it would be in the US standard with maybe 400 or something. Mm, it's not doing much. I've upgraded from the 1200 to 600. And I have no idea what that is in the American standard. That's reasonably coarse. Yeah, it's not taking it at all. I'll just keep going a, a little bit. I, I'm not going to get them out. I've sanded this off pretty heavily. This was badly affected. This not so much. There's still some little dots there. I'm not going to go mad on it because it's just, you might, I might make it worse than what it is. So I'm happy to leave it like that and I'll start doing the Retrobrite process. Now it looks like they've put a bit of clear lacquer over this Made in Australia symbol on the back here. So I'll just sand it off of the plastic here. It was around in a circle there, so if I left that on there I'd end up with a darker circle. So I'll just sand that away. Yeah, I think that's taken that off. Good. I've cut a bit of masking tape out. I'm going to put it over this symbol to hopefully keep the hydrogen peroxide out of there. I've done this a number of times. This is uh, hydrogen peroxide. You get it from the chemist, pharmacy or drugstore, wherever you live. And uh, it's just for putting in your hair to blonde it up, I suppose. So all you do is put the peroxide on here and put it out in the sun in a plastic bag. And it should take this brown off. Now the process is called Retrobrite. It doesn't, it's not really anybody's process. It's just something some computer geeks came up with when they were trying to brighten up the cases from the 1970s computers. So it's just picked up the name Retrobrite. There's a whole Wikipedia article on it. So if you want to read about it and it tells you all the different ways of doing it. I live in Queensland. I'll just throw it out in the sun. If you live in Sweden or something like that, you can put it in the oven. You can put UV lights on it. I believe it benefits from UV lights. Uh, you can add laundry powder. There's all sorts of different ways of doing it. So all I've done is put a reasonably thick coating on it. I have a vacuum seal bag here. This is a food saver bag, whatever you want to call them. You vacuum down, vacuum your food in it. So I'll pop it in there. I'll take this inside. I'll seal this end up and I'll just throw it out in the backyard for the day. Um, it's a bit bit overcast today so I might actually have to do it for a couple of days. I need to do these other two pieces then I'll put it out the backyard with this one. I've sealed both of them up and I've left as much air as I can in there. When I put them out in the sun they'll expand and the plastic bag will move away from the uh, plastic case. So I'll go and throw them on the back lawn. Now while the case is sitting outside, I thought I'll paint this because it is a very uh, creamy yellow colour. It's got that old age look about it. I'm going to leave the bottom. I'm happy with the bottom. So I'll mask that off. I'll have to mask this off. And then I'll give it a spray paint. Now here's some paint. It's called Hogs Bristle. It's Dulux. And that's pretty close to the origin. I think that'll be okay. So I'll use that. So to prepare for paint, I'm just going to sit here and run steel wool up and down the grooves. And uh, just sort of rough it up a little bit with that and give it a spray paint and these paints go straight on the plastic, they're terrific. Now I spent a fair bit of time just making sure this is spotlessly clean. There's a couple of little scratches, I've sanded them out, so I can give it a coat of paint.
Now I've just given that a very light coat. I'll give it another coat in about 10 minutes or so. Just maybe need three coats or something to get full coverage and that'll be done. Uh, now I ended up giving this, I think, three coats. It's been drying for uh, quite a few hours now. It's just concerned that the paint might have bled through onto the numbers, but it hasn't. It's good. Oh, that's fine. Good. Let's take that off as well. There we go. And that needs a little bit more drying, but it's, gosh, it's good. It's, it's, you wouldn't know it was painted. It was painted originally, of course, uh, and this bit's painted, but uh, you wouldn't know that was painted. That looks great. All right. Fantastic. I'll let it dry off. I just washed this. This is the tuning dial, and it's as clear as the day it was made. It's in great condition. I'll just give it a quick polish with some plastics just to sort of take the dullness off it, but uh, yeah, it's clear it hasn't gone yellow at all. I put these out in the backyard two days ago and I, I took them in last night and put them out again this morning. We got about 10 minutes of sun in those two days, so they really haven't worked as well as they should have. Um, I don't know if you can see it, that's kind of, there's, it's brown there, there's the original colour there, it's still brown and it's kind of blotchy too, so uh, I'm going to do it again. I'll wait a couple of days till the sun comes out put them back in the bags and I'm going to try again and we'll have a look after that. I'm about to do the RF alignment and I've got a little bit of time so I thought I'll just lay out what I'm doing. If you know all about this stuff just skip ahead. So let's assume we've got a radio station over here. It's got an antenna on the top. It transmits a sinusoidal wave with the signal on top of it. We'll say it's transmitting at 600 kilohertz. Our radio has an antenna on the top. The antenna picks up the signal and we feed it into a coil which we call the antenna coil. Alongside the antenna coil is the tuning capacitor. Now when you have a coil and a capacitor you can make it resonate at a certain frequency. It's called a tank circuit. So to get the 600 kilohertz into our radio we tune that to 600. That's about 600. Now that tank circuit's resonating at 600, it'll pass the signal through to the radio. So that's one of the adjustments. We need to get that to resonate at 600. We have a second gang here, and this is called the local oscillator. That also has a coil, and we make that resonate as well. So this little tank circuit is self-oscillating. It produces its own frequency. The next in line is the mixer valve, or the converter valve, or the first detector, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to mix these two frequencies together. So we've got 600 here, our IF, our intermediate frequency on this radio, and it's fairly typical, is 455. The 455 is what we're going to pass through the radio with the signal attached to the top of it. We've got this tuned to 600, the radio station's coming through on 600. We need this to be 455 above that 600. So we need this to resonate at 1055. So this is resonating at 600. This is 1055. We jumble it all together into the mixer or converter and we get four main signals out. You'll get the 600 you put in. You'll get the 1055. You'll get the addition of those two signals there, which will be, uh, what, 1655. And you'll also get the difference between those two. And that'll be 455. We don't want these ones. We want this one. To do that, we put in filters, and they're called intermediate frequency transformers. These are tank circuits, similar to that. They have a coil and a capacitor, and we can adjust those, so they resonate at 455. So what comes out here is 455. We amplify it, it goes into another IF. We can adjust that, so that also is 455. Whoops. Over there. Now this 455 signal is then sent off to the detector and the amp. The amplifier section is called AF or audio frequency. This section up here, this tuning section here is called RF for radio frequency. And this section here is called IF for intermediate frequency. That's the frequency between the two. Now so what we're trying to achieve is this oscillator is set to the correct frequency when this one is set to the correct frequency. So we need to set that at 600, we need to set that at 1055, and the pointer needs to point to 600 on the dial. The first thing we've got to do is set the pointer up on the dial. 
So let's set the dial. On this one, it would simply be the fact that this is horizontal. Now some radios may have a um, line on there or a mark or something. Uh, others you just center. So that looks pretty good. Let's move that a little bit. All right, now the second thing we do is put the dial on 600. And in this case, because I don't have uh, any markings on here as to the frequency, I know 7ZL in Hobart is 600. I've got the generator on 600 there. And because this is on ZL, that should come through loud and clear there. I haven't put a meter on it. I'll, I'll just do it by ear at this stage. And it looks like it's a bit out. There it is there. All right. Here's the oscillator on the radio. Here's the oscillator we're looking at here. And what's happening is the pointer is pointing to 600 or ZL, but this is not resonating at 1055. So we can change that resonant point by adjusting the screw on this one. Mine doesn't have the screw. It has a slug in the middle like this one does, but you have to turn it from inside with a, a slot in the top of the slug. Same thing though. So what I'm gonna do is reposition the pointer to ZL and I'll adjust this slug up and down until we get it to peak. So if I put my little adjuster in here, find the slot, there it is, and I'll move that slightly towards the ZL there so I know which way to turn this. It's not helping. No, it's getting further away. Here it comes. Just turn it up a bit. All right, so that's now adjusted. What that means now is this oscillator circuit is now oscillating at 1055 with a pointer pointing to 600. The next step is to go up to the top end of the scale and we'll put it, I'll put it on 1500. You would normally do it about 14. I've got a marking for 3AK, which is 1500. So I'm gonna use 1500. There will be a trimmer to trim this end of the scale. We don't adjust this again at the top end. This is all done down the bottom. So the cores are adjusted at the low frequency. Trimmers on the top. I'll change the generator here, make that 15. And I'll put the dial on 3AK, which is 1500. Or it just says AK there, of course. Well, there it is. Wow, it's right on it. So we don't need to adjust anything there. I'll just turn it up and make sure it's right. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. So I don't need to adjust it. I'll show you what I would have adjusted if I had to. Now this is what I would have used to adjust it if I needed to. These are pretty much factory set, but you can adjust them if you want to, and I've done it on other radios. But this is just a tube. It has a wire running through the center of it. It has another wire wrapped around the outside, and all you do is wrap or unwrap wire on it to change its capacitance. Because this is spot on, and as I said, it's factory set, they don't really expect you to do anything with it later in life. But what you can do is if I change the capacitance of it by putting my finger on it and come back here, I can retune that. There it is there. So I'll take my finger off. It goes back where it was. And if that had come up short of 3AK or 1500, I could have added some more wire back onto it. If it had overshot 1500, I could have taken a bit more off. There's not much left on there, so I wouldn't have been too keen mucking around with this one, but it doesn't need to be adjusted. Anyway, that's the trimmer for the oscillator. Now that's it for the oscillator part. If we had to adjust the trimmer, you would have to go back and just keep adjusting back and forth and make sure that they stay the same. When you adjust the trimmer, you may impact the position down here. So you just gotta go back and forth till you get it right at both ends. So that means the oscillator section is now set up correctly. So all we have to do now is make sure the antenna is on the same page. So we'll go back to 600. With this pointer on 600, we adjust this coil for peak output. This coil has an adjustment on the end. We don't have that on this radio. What we have is a loop stick antenna or a ferrite rod antenna, whatever you want to call it. And you move the coil up and down on the ferrite rod. Now this has been glued in at the factory. I'm not going to touch it but I still need to make sure that is resonating at 600. I've got the generator on 600 again. I've got this set to ZL, which we know is 600. I've also connected my meter up. So to find out if this is 600, what we do is use a procedure called rocking. 
Now the idea is that I move this away from 600 on the dial. I follow it up by adjusting the oscillator down here. And if I get a stronger signal, then I know this isn't at 600 because I've moved away from 600. I have the meter on 30 on the top. So if I move the dial away, it drops off. I'll follow it up with the oscillator and see if we can get better than 30. And we can. Lots better. So that means that coil is not oscillating at 600. So I'll go a bit further. Oh. I think that's about it. So how far off are we? Oh, just a little bit. It's not far, is it? I'll turn that down. So decision time. Do I try and move this coil or do I move the dial to align with the um, ZL or the 600 again? The problem is if I move the dial and then somebody comes along and someday overruns it and just moves along a bit, they'll set it up to neutral, come back here and these will all be out. It's not a big deal. It'll only be out that much. It's not, it's not huge. All right, I'm going to try and move this coil. I'm hoping it's just a bit of wax on the end here. Perhaps try the other end as well. I don't want to ruin the coil. That'll be the last thing. I'll see if that'll move. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Okay. I've repositioned the dial to the center of ZL, or 600. So I'll adjust the uh, oscillator to maximum. Adjust this to maximum. I'm using my fingers, which is going to affect it. Maximum. So that's about it there. I'll adjust the oscillator a little bit. Right, we're maximized everywhere. Okay. We're still in the middle of ZL. That's maximized. That's maximized. I'll put a bit of something there to hold that. And we're done. Just got a little bit of wax there. I'll just see if that'll melt in. The wax is dried there and it's holding it quite well. I've put the generator back on 1500 and I'll just go up and make sure we're still somewhere near 3 AK and the 1500. That's right in the middle of 3 AK, so it's perfect. All right, we'll carry on with the rest of it. We're going well. We have the pointer set up. We've got the low end of the oscillator set up. We've got the high end of the oscillator set up. And now we've got the low end of the radio frequency set up. All we have to do is put it up to 1500 again. There's a little trimmer capacitor on top of the radio tuner and we can trim this to just make the range that this capacitor here operates over longer or shorter. And we adjust that so that it is exactly 455 away from this one. And you do that simply by turning the trimmer and getting the peak output from this capacitor. First thing, of course, is we put that on 1500. I'll put the dial back on 1500 or 3AK. There's the little trimmer on the top. I'll just turn the volume up a bit. Okay. Now all we've got to do is rotate this to get the uh, peak volume. Less. More. Less. And you would have to say that's exactly where it was. So that's it. It's pretty simple really. It's just a matter of getting the pointer and these points to all line up with each other and you're done. I hope that helped a little bit. I'm probably not the best instructor in the world, but this is pretty easy once you work it out. Anyway, I'm going to move on. I'm going to put the radio back in the case. Right, I've got all the parts for the case. They're all cleaned up and ready to go together. The hydrogen peroxide effort on this wasn't as good even after the second try. And the back is a little blotchy. In fact, it's sort of blotchy all over. And I think the problem was that the bag was sitting on it 
and because it wasn't hot enough it didn't balloon the bag out like it normally does and keep it away and I think that's what went wrong there but anyway it's not, not bad it's just not quite as good as it could be uh, this front half has come out all right that looks quite respectable on the top and of course the the front panel the paint on there looks fantastic it's really good so I'll start assembling it now the first thing to do is put this front in here and then we put that on the radio so that should go in there there we go all right there's five screws to go back in and then I'll come back I've put the screws in I've just got to put the back on I'll get rid of this cushion Now I'm going to attempt to put the back on again. I struggle getting this apart. You've got to get a fair angle on it, I think, to get it all clipped together. Oh, gosh. Oh, there it goes. Right. And put the two screws back in. All right, I need to put the dial on. Uh, you'll remember that I had trouble with the dial hitting hard against the case and I couldn't move it. So I've made up a little spacer here out of a bit of perspex so that it doesn't affect the light shining through and that'll keep it away from the case for me. Now I've got to get this on and it's not easy. Because it's, because it's got fingers on it, they splay out. It's very hard to get this on. Well, it's quite hard. There we go. Alright, I've got to line this up again, of course. So I'll just keep going until it lines up. Oops, went too far. About there, I think. That looks good. Yeah, a little cap to go in the top there. Alright, and the last thing is the knob. There we go. Beautiful. All right, it's warmed up. I'll just put some volume on. We'll just listen to it for a second. Asked for 3.6 trillion US dollars. But the IMF notes that climate-oriented funds only account for 130 billion US dollars. So just a fraction of what you might expect. It's a play today. Responsibly. Gambler's help. 1-800-858-858. G'day. It's Kimmy. Hey. What? I'm not. And... And the source of 12 of his nearest uh, for sure and Danny Shum who's got seven and it's a similar tale on the jockeys uh, Zach Purden has become a very important yeah so working really well it's still got a lot of hum it's only a half wave rectifier um, I think it needs bigger capacitors to get rid of that little bit of hum there anyway I'm not going to worry about it but um, it does have a little bit of hum when the volume's up you can't hear it of course this is a Chrysler 1199. They made them from 1965 to 1974. Now, according to Radio Museum, this is the last domestic uh, valve-operated radio that was um, marketed in Australia. So um, they hung in to the end there. And apparently people preferred the valve radios over transistors for a little while. There's a bit of reluctance to change. Look, it's come up pretty good. I'm not over the moon with the finish, but it's not that bad. So you remember how brown it was originally. Um, so there's the difference now. So that's the original color there. And this is what the hydrogen peroxide has brought it back to. So it's not too bad, is it? But it's still sort of got this browny look about it. So anyway, well, that's it. I'll put this on display with the rest of them. And I, I quite like the design of this one. Now, this was a pretty easy repair and it was good for me while I'm on light duties. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you can join me for my next radio adventure. It was a hot morning in Florida. At Cape Kennedy, sitting in seat 32, row E of the press stand, was reporter Darren Hinch of the Sydney Sun and MBS News. Two, one, zero, and the flames. You can see them now, and she's ready to go. It's starting to move. And if you can hear the noise, the people are on their feet now saying, Go, you beauty! Go, and here it comes now, the roar! I know that as long as I live, I am never going to see anything quite like this one.